Right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Marr. Uh, I was born in Leaslip in 1948 in the main street. Um, most children back then were born at home. And uh, I was uh, grew up in the village uh, all my life till I got married and then uh, moved to Selbridge. But back in the the 19 early 50s, Leaslip had a population of about 550 to 600, and that would have included the townlands around Kilmacredic, uh, Coultrina, um, all the other Castletown, um, out the Mount Hunter, up where the back of Intel is now. A huge big townland uh, with very few people in it. The main village was. Um, very run down from that period. I remember uh, no water, no sewage. Everybody had an outdoor toilet at the back, which was always very difficult to use in the middle of the winter, I can tell you. But um, uh, in 1960, uh, the main sewage and water came through the village and uh, we all connected up to it. So uh, each house had, had to connect up itself. So um, they, I remember the village having electricity because they built the dam in Leaslip in 1948, the year I was born, and it was providing uh, electricity to the village through the national grid. But the outside, up the Captain's Hill, up the Maynooth Road, into the Green Lane, the back of Intel, the Mount Thunder area, the Confi area, and no electricity. Um, and then I went to school at the age of three, actually, 1951, uh, which was what you did when you got to, I was the youngest in my family. And when I got to a certain age, my brothers were in the in national school as well. So I just went along in what they called baby infants in those days. And the school was made up, it was down at the Rye. It's still a building on in the in Leaslip, uh, below the Catholic Church. It's called the Den now, but in those days it was the um, the National School, and it was built just after the famine, and it had not changed. So there was no electricity. There was um, an outdoor toilet at the back, and I remember a galvanized door with a stick. So when you went to the toilet, you picked up the stick, you banged the door, and the rats ran out. And then you went in. And that's, that's the way it was. We all took it for granted that this is the way you, you went to the loo. There was a stone wall when you just had a pee as a child up against this uh, granite uh, or limestone wall. It's still there to this day. You can go and visit it. And um, my first day in school, uh, I actually drank the ink out of the inkwell. And my brother was ordered to take me down to the Rye River, which was foaming at the time, uh, to wash my hands in the cold river. So uh, that was my first experience of school. I remember the school teacher, his name was Leonard. Now, I think he was an ex-British Army uh, teacher uh, and was very strict. And he would inspect the older guys. I remember lining up in the, in the school in the yard, which was between the, the, the den, the school and the river, lining up. And he was inspecting all the uh, the senior infants with, uh, to see how they washed their neck. And uh, I remember him pushing their neck this side. And if there was, kids would give their face a lick with water in the morning. You'd only wash once a week back then at the weekend in a big tub. But during the week, you'd have a, a line, a mark. And if, if you had a dirt line on your neck, I remember him with a cane and he hit the kids on the neck to go down to the river and wash your, your, your face. So it, it was a, a tough time. Now, there was a, a teacher called Mrs. Malloy who lived in, in the, uh, who uh, ran the baby infants and she was a lady and we all loved her. And then by the time I went into the first class, Mr. Leonard, thank God, had retired. And then there was a, a man called uh, James Ruan, we used to with Jemmy Ruan. And I went through all of national school with him. Now, like I said, I left in 1962 to go to the Tech in Lucan. And we'd moved to a new school in 19... 54, I think the new school was built up behind the Catholic Church in Leaslip. It's still there today. And... Uh, I left in 1960, I think, 1961, uh, and uh, no electricity. I went through all of national school without uh, electricity or running water. 
and even in the new school, they felt it wasn't necessary. Sure, all these kids had come from a, a school who had no electricity ever. So why should we switch it on now? Anyway, we couldn't afford it. So um, here was a brand new school with plenty of light coming in. But um, I remember the teacher having a primus stove to boil a kettle to make a cup of tea for himself. So uh, growing up in Leaslip then was a very, it was a very safe environment. You know, we all learned to swim in the Liffey, even though my mother was terrified of it because polio was a big thing back then and she thought it was from the river. So um, yeah, we were always sort of had to sneak out with our swim trunks and go up the Rye River up beyond the National School and we learned, all learned to swim up there. And I remember uh, the odd occasion during the summer evenings at nine, ten o'clock at night, my mother coming up to the, the swimming area and putting her dress inside our bloomers or knickers and climbing, walking into the river after me and dragging me out at ten o'clock at night. And she said I used to look like a prune. I was that shriveled up. Be in the water from ten in the morning till ten in the evening, you know. So um, we all learned to swim there. Um, the, we went to the local cinema down in Lucan and um, my aunt ran the printing works down in Lucan and printed the posters for the cinema and each poster came with a complimentary so I got into the cinema for free. So it was an interesting time. Uh, mostly agriculture uh, was the main business. There was um, a famous carpentry shop of which my father was a part of, uh, Heron Houses, Heron Homes on the Captain's Hill. And before that, uh, my uncle and my father were cabinet makers in the um, a, 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 a least the cabinet making company that did marvellous work, supplied units from, for Ireland at the time. Then um, the meat factory in Leaslip back in the 60s was a big affair. Uh, it employed 1,200 people. Uh, there was always full employment in the in village. For some reason, it was one of those villages that never had, we'll say, um, a great emigration problem. Although I remember young men going off uh, to London to work. But um, there was always employment. The meat factory, Wookie's Mills, the jean factory in the main street, uh, the farm community there was always work and for right from the time we were 10 years of age you worked during the summer holidays so you I remember working in the, on the farms doing the thrashing machine up in Confi uh, then when I was about 12 I went to Lucan Tech and learned how to operate a, a lathe machine and then got a summer job in Johnson Well Screens at 12 years of age operating a huge lathe, which was unheard of nowadays in health and safety. But at 13 years of age, I was cutting rings for oil wells in Saudi Arabia, uh, metal rings. And then um, at 14, during the summer holidays, uh, we all got work in the meat factory. And that was tough. I remember um, during the during the summer holidays, you got a, I think we got about four or five pounds a week, which was good money back then. Uh, and our job was to box meat and to uh, to uh, clean up the, the conveyor belts uh, with, with steam guns. And um, strangely enough, I remember in 1964, at the age of 63, 60, they're on 60, the early 60s, working in the meat factory during the summer holidays. And we were boxing meat for a place called Vietnam. And the American army, we got the meat factory needs to have got a contract from the American army. And there was two American catering marines uh, from the embassy in Dublin marching up and down the conveyor belts in their uniforms, telling everybody to get your hair cut. You know, and we all went around with these USA, US military haircuts. Um, so they were very strict. And I remember um, my job was to stamp Vietnam on a box of meat and have it wrapped. It was frozen meat sending out to Vietnam. And I remember asking one of the older guys, where is this place called Vietnam? And he told me that it was out the far side of Mayo. And I believed them. So I was happy enough. The meat was going to Mayo. So um, that was um, that was the times that were in Lee Slip, you know. I mean, I said very safe, very family orientated. And what doesn't happen now that if we were um, out playing in the fields outside Lee Slip, there was always a, another big factory. Sorry, I forgot. My father-in-law's factory, actually. Uh, Casey Plastics down the Mill Lane. It employed over 200 people uh, making plastic coats. 
boats and they had an alarm, a, 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 a sort of a World War II siren on the factory wall. And if when that went off at six o'clock at night, you had to be home in your house by 10 past six. So no matter where you were in Leeslip, when the Casey's horn blew, it, it was like a, a World War II uh, London siren. Um, you had to be home within 10, 15 minutes. If not, you, my mother would be waiting for you with the dishcloth. She always carried a dishcloth over her shoulder and you'd get a smack on the legs from it, you know. But rare enough, she, she was a great mother, I have to say. Now, um, I remember, um, if you got up to trouble. So I remember one time um, walking across the bridge at Leaslip on the railings with no safety rail. There was only about four inches wide and I must have been about eight or 10. And I was a dare to walk across the railings on Leaslip Bridge over the Liffey and uh, jumped off. And by the time I got home, my mother knew I had been up on the bridge uh, causing mischief. So I got into trouble for that. So the Bush Telegraph worked very well. That was no matter what happened or what development you got up to around the village, whether it's up around the back of Leaslip Castle or up on Hickey's Hills, my mother knew what you were up to before I got home. I could never understand how that happened, but uh, it was the nature of neighbours looking out for kids. And a neighbour would give you a clip in the ear if you stepped out a lion. And if you went home and told your mother, you get another clip in the ear because what did you do wrong was the answer. You know, why did Mrs. So-and-so have to give out to you, you know? So the community reared the children. I remember uh, being able to walk in and out of houses. All the houses in the main street had keys in the front door. And um, my aunt's house didn't have a key in the front door up at where uh, Kennedy's um, uh, accountants are now on Mars Lane. That lane was called after my grandfather in the main street. That was my grandfather's family home. But my aunt, her key was inside the windowsill. So you lifted up the window, picked the key up and opened the lock on the door and went in if there was nobody there. So there was always that trust that there was keys in everybody's door and you went in and out. You would go in and uh, you, you, we would be told to go and look after Mrs. Brady, who might have been very old, uh, bring her her groceries. Uh, there was the kids were always running in and out of people's houses, helping older people uh, to bring in the water. Uh, and like I said, there was no water in the village when I was growing up. There was a pump up outside the middle shop. Uh, at number eight the mile and you uh, an aluminium bucket you'd pump the water with a big handle on the pump and um, best of water I have to say and carry it back to your house without spilling it on your shoes which was nearly impossible so you always end up with wet feet uh, the bucket was kept in a press in the kitchen with a little metal cup and uh, it was spared. that's the way it was rain water was kept in big barrels outside and once a week my mother would bring you out and uh, at six or eight years of age, dip your head in the barrel and with carbolic soap, wash your hair. And I can remember in the middle of winter, her breaking the ice on the on this barrel of water and pouring it over your head. I still have that memory. But listen, we survived. OK, uh, well, there was a, a very serious situation happened and it had a long lasting effect, even with me today now, I always remember it. There was uh, <clears throat> 1960, uh, we had sent the Irish army over to the Congo, the Belgium Congo in Africa. And it was, we were so badly equipped. And for some reason, the United Nations asked for Ireland to go and we shipped out loads of troops. And one of the one of the, the soldiers was a man called Sonny Gaynor, uh, Sergeant Sonny Gaynor. And he operated in Cahill Brewer Barracks, but lived at the top of the Captain's Hill. Now, if you go up to Captain's Hill out of Leaslip and turn right into St. Mary's Park, that house on the corner was the Gaynor household. And I remember him as a young lad. Um, and he was, I always remember being a handsome man and the uniform, I, 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 you know, when you're, you're sort of 10 years of age, 12 years of age, the uniforms were very important. They looked great. And he always kept a Macaulay and he had a big motorbike, a big army motorbike. And what I discovered later on that he was in the motorbike uh, squadron in Cahill uh, the motorised 
section in Cahal Brewer. And he used to drive the bike home from Cahal Brewer Barracks to Leaslip every night. And we would be waiting at the, a couple of us would be waiting at the bottom of the captain's hill. And you could hear them coming in the distance because there was no cars back then. But you could hear this big motorbike nearly at the Spa Hotel down in Lucan coming along by Springfield. And you'd say you could hear him coming across the Liffey Bridge and then up the town. And he'd stop at the bottom of the captain's hill. And the treat was to get a lift on the motorbike to the top of the hill. And <clears throat> I remember, it's very emotional now, but I remember holding them. You know, when you get on the back of the motorbike and you, you put your arms around, and to this day, I can still feel them in the uniform. And it still cracks me up. But um, anyway, he went off to the Congo, and I remember the story in the village was, he had a young family, five. His mother, his wife was, had did four children, and the youngest was uh, pregnant. The mother was still pregnant when he went to the Congo. And uh, I remember getting maybe four or five jaunts on the motorbike, you know, and to be able to feel the old Bulls Bull uniform and hanging on, there was no seat on the back of those motorbikes. There, there was a little sort of square bit of leather that you sat on and you'd hold on to him and he'd fly up the hill and when you get to the top of the hill, he'd let you off. And then the next night he might take another kid up. So this was a great memory for, and this soldier. So, um, but disaster struck, he was killed in the Niemba ambush with nine other soldiers. Eight or nine other soldiers were, were ambushed in the Congo in a place called Niemba. And when the bodies came back a, a few months later, the, um, the town organised buses for us all to go over to Baldonnell to see the wake, or the, the laying out of the truth, the, so the dead soldiers in Baldonnell. And I remember all the buses parked down the main street in Leeslip. And we all getting on, my father, mother, the whole town just got on these buses. I don't know who organised it, but there were the old CIE buses, the down country buses, we used to call them, single decker. And um, there must have been 10 or 12 of them and the whole village got on because Sergeant Gaynor was, um, he was on the same football team. So he was in St. Mary's football club. And I remember him playing with my father, although my father was a bit older. He was he was a young man at the time. As it turns out, I was a bit shocked later on in life to find out that he was only 29. And when you're 10 years of age, you think he was old, but he was 29 years of age. And I remember getting on the bus and the silence going over to Baldonnell, getting out onto the onto the runway in Baldonnell, walking into the big hangar and seeing all these coffins up on stilts. Now, when you're young and you, there was a walkway through these nine or eight coffins and they were up really high, I remember, and candles lighting and four soldiers at each coffin. It was very, very sad. And then we didn't uh, then we went home and the whole um town was distraught there was masses held and the, i remember mrs gaynor going to the mass with her young children and it was a very traumatic experience for the village but in then there was the big funeral in Dublin, which was televised. And it was the largest funeral ever in Dublin. I think over half a million people uh, were in O'Connell Street when the, the soldiers went through. It's actually on YouTube. You can still see it on YouTube. I've often watched it uh, going to Glasnevin. And even to this day now, when I'm passing by Glasnevin, I still call in and visit the grave. Um, so it, it's, it was a very sad time. And then it became uh, at 12 years of age, I remember thinking, you know, army, military, you know. And then I discovered a few friends of mine who went to school with up in the Green Lane were in a thing called the FCA in Minute. And I learned about it, you know, and then I thought, yeah, that'd be nice. And to follow in the footsteps of Sergeant Gaynor as a young 13 uh, year old. And I was sort of slightly big. And I, there was a there was an old tradition of taking kids in underage. You were supposed to be 17, but if you're anything between 13 and 17, you, you sort of joined. I remember the sergeant, uh, the quartermaster sergeant handing out uniforms and he'd give you the uniforms and he says, there's your trousers, all you need is an arse to fill it. <laughs> when you're young. So uh, we all, uh, I remember joining up with a few other guys uh, in Leaslip and what happened was the army truck would come out from Collins's barracks. 
and stop in the main street, uh, we'd all pile on, maybe four or five of us that joined at the same time. I remember uh, um, Larry Hart, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, Dennis Carney, Colin Purcell, who still lives here in Selbridge. And uh, yeah, there was a couple of, a lot of us at that stage decided to join all together. So we all went up and the FCA centre was in Minute. It was in the town hall on the, the opposite the, um, as you go down the main street and the turn for Kilcock at the bottom of the main street, there was a big dance hall there on the right hand side. That was the FCA centre. So we all ended up in there. And I remember we were about all joined up and we were marching up and down inside the hall in civilian clothes. Our uniforms weren't ready for us. So um, we decided to um, it was planned that we would the truck would come out to lease the one night and turn around and go back into Collins's barracks where we would get our uniform. So I remember going into the quartermaster store in Collins's barracks and getting the big FCA boots, the big great coat, which was great to put over the bed in the winter. Everybody had it over the bed. It was a great extra blanket and uh, the great coat it was known as. And then your tunic, which was different from the regular tunic. It was a small tunic where the regulars more like had a suit, had the pockets underneath the belt. Ours was a tunic type uniform, which separated us from the regular army. And uh, with brown boots, green beret, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the the belt, and uh, yeah, and the brass buttons uh, with the harp on them, and we polished those till they nearly wore out. Mm. I discovered that I hadn't told my mother that I joined the FCA at 13 years of age. So I hid the uniform upstairs in the in the bedroom and I used to um, you know she the reason I didn't tell her was that I knew that she had experienced an incident in Lucan with the black and tans where she was nearly shot as a child when the black and tans were leaving Lucan they opened fired they lived uh, was, uh, sorry the black and tans uh, camped in Sarchfield's domain and when they were leaving Ireland for the last time they were all drunk and they fired bullets into uh, rifles into the uh the, um, the, the guard of barracks, which was the RIC barracks then. And my mother was standing on the bridge waving goodbye to them. And she remembers the bullets hitting the road. Her grandfather, her, my grandfather, her father ran across the road to pick her up and run out. And she still remembers the bullets and the noise of the bullets hitting the road and the glass breaking in the windows in the barracks. And to this day, I could bring you down and show you the bullet holes that she showed me. And I was a little fella. So that was a story that I remember. Now I'm thinking, my God, I've joined uh, an army. She's not going to be too pleased because she hated guns. She hated everything. So I used to, uh, when she, I used to bring my uniform uh, to work and put it on and then go to the, uh, get on the army truck without her knowing. This went on for a few weeks until one night the army gave me a 303 rifle to bring home. And the game was up. I wasn't going to be able to hide this. So, but of course, knowing my mother, she knew all along I had joined the FCA because somebody had told her. But um, I remember dressing up one night and the, the rifle was up under my bed. I'd sneaked it into the house and I said, I'm not going to be able to get out of the house with a big 303 rifle. So I'm going to have to present myself to her. So she was sitting in the sitting room and um, I opened the door and walked in dressed in my FCA uniform, carrying the big rifle. And she turned around and she said, oh, my God, she says, has De Valera lost these marbles, given the child a rifle? <laughs> I can remember saying that as well. So uh, anyway, uh, I spent a, a great portion. I, I must have been there from 1962 to 1969. I left the FCA in June of 1969, just before the troubles broke out. I got very involved in canoeing and representing Ireland abroad. And the, it was just difficult to balance the two. So I'd done my piece. And um, I remember uh, going to the annual uh, camps every year, the two weeks down in Gormanstown, getting a little bit of money. Uh, you got a gratuity for turning up in Minute in your centre. Um, and then that's when you'd meet up with all the rest of your 
battalion. Now, I was in C Company 7 Battalion, which was based in, in Collins' Barracks. But um, the company was also based in Kilcock, which was the heavy machine gun section, the Vickers machine guns. Selbridge here in Selbridge, uh, in the old church hall on the bridge in Selbridge, that was the FCA hall. That was the mortar section. And then we were the rifle section in Minute. So when we met once a year in Gormerstown, we were all together in the camp and we used to carry out manoeuvres and Vickers machine guns and mortars and rifles and playing soldiers. And we all had a great time. I really did. I really loved it. And then in 1965, we were told that the camp was cancelled and that we were ordered to turn up uh, to be extras in a movie called The Blue Max. Well, we thought we'd died and gone to heaven. This was Hollywood coming to Leaslip. And Leaslip was a very boring place back then. And uh, we learned that this movie was a World War I movie. It was going to be based at Western Airport in Leaslip with all the planes. It was a World War I um, uh, airplane type combat movie. And um, we were going to do the trench scenes in the First World War up in the Wicklow Mountains. So 2,000 of us joined, uh, ended up in Cahill Brewer Barracks getting our German uniforms. And it was a sight. We were just like having a great time, I remember. And um, we spent two weeks in August in 1965 charging out of the trenches every morning as the planes flew over from Weston and bombs, bullets, the Battle of the Somme. It, it was an amazing sight. I still have great memories back then of thinking what it must have been like for... Um, the ordinary uh, soldier in the First World War, when we were now 50 years later, 1965, playing, acting in a movie. But the set was very realistic. The Battle of the Somme laid out in front of you in trenches. And about 200 yards away was the British trench. And there was a French, a French, um, a film director who was coordinating everything, I remember. And we were lucky. Our section, the Minute section, Selbridge section, was right down at the cameras. And we can see, I can see lads in the movie for that split second from our section. But we were beside the stunt men who were getting blown up and dropping dead and all beside us. And then right from where the camera was based all the way up the Wicklow Mountains, this big long trench dug and it was perfectly made as in the First World War. But what the producers didn't realise was that the British Army in the British Army trenches were um, A Company 7th Battalion, were all Jackines from, from McKee Barracks, all dubs. We were all culchies. And of course, when we we were told to charge across no man land, some of us was to die, but most of us was to get to the trench, jump into the trench and fight, uh, let on to fight with the British Army in the British Army trench. But nobody told the director that there was now uh, 200 Culchies going to descend on 200 Jackines and there was slaughter. The, the ambulance taking guys away, beating up. We just killed each other in the trenches. And I remember the producer shouting at us saying, it's only a movie. Do not kill each other. You know, this French accent. So uh, they realised that this wasn't a good thing to do, you know, because we knew these guys, but the fact that they were from Dublin, we were going to have a go at them. So that was very interesting. And then we met uh, men who had fought in the First World war they brought them up to show them the, the set and some of them were crying I remember I thought how could you have fought in a war and then actually come up and see what was a real set I mean the the, the explosions and the 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 bomb craters with water in them and floating dead horses, which were fiberglass, of course. But it all looked terribly realistic. And then to get out of the trench, and I remember about 100 yards away, maybe 100 or 200 yards away, the no man's land with this trench and there was a machine gun, British machine gun. You could see the tin Lizzie helmets and this thing open and fired. And it was, it was fired in blanks. But it was making this noise that a Vickers machine gun made. It was that, 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 that. And to get out of the trench and run towards this gun and then people dropping dead all around you, acting out, was just an amazing sight. And I kept on thinking, what was it like for the, the men who actually fought in it? It must have been horrendous. And we did meet men. Our postman in Leaslip was... Um, 
it was fought in the First World War, and I talked to him about it. There was a Mr. Bakeman up on the Selvage Road who fought in the First World War. There was a whole group of men in Leaslip who fought in the First World War. And when they came home, um, some of them joined the IRA and some of them joined the Free State Army during the Civil War. And I grew up with all that bitterness and hatred still in the 50s. So, uh, yeah, interesting times between making the Blue Max movie and then uh, learning how to shoot. And of course, when you're a child, guns and all, I became, um, I got selected for the uh, 1967 for the uh, I won the battalion shoot which was a couple of hundred guys firing rifles down in Gormerstown and I, I I won the event and then I was nominated for the second second brigade which was the Dublin Eastern Command. I represented the 2nd Brigade and the Curragh Camp and it was a mixture of regular and FCA back then but that stopped now, funny enough, because what happened back in those days was the FCA guys were beating the regulars and that didn't go down too well with the regular army guys. So I think they separated the competition. Now there's an FCA competition and there was a, a regular army competition. But in my day, we all fought, uh, we all fired in the competition and I actually ended up getting fifth in the all army. And I was, I think at that stage, I was the youngest corporal uh, ever to, to get that far because there was all sergeants and officers in it as well. So uh, I was very pleased with myself. Um, and uh, I remember getting five pound and marksman's madge, uh, badge uh, that you put on your, stitched onto your epaulet, onto your shoulder and, and a trophy. And uh, yeah, that that was interesting. I, I, I remember coming back to Leaslip thinking I was the the cheese on the on the box. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was it. The, the 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 FCA days were good days. I have to say, back in in those days, and I made lots of friends, and still have lots of friends, even though I'm seventy one now. And great memories of that period, that six or whatever, six year, seven year period.